It's good to see each and every one of you here tonight. I want to uh, present some information that I think will be very uplifting and helpful to you. I don't know if you've ever gone to a dentist. I know you have. And I heard about the Browns going to a dentist office, Mr. and Mrs. Brown. And Mr. Brown goes in there and says to the dentist, uh, we don't want a needle. We don't want to deaden this thing at all. We want you to just pull that tooth, get it out of there so we can get out of here. And that dentist looked at him and said, boy, I wish I had more patience with that kind of attitude, a stoic attitude. They're ready to go and get it done no matter what. And then he asked, now, which tooth is it? And Mr. Brown said, honey, show him the tooth. <laughs> you know, it's easy for someone to tell you, you need to lose 50 pounds. You need to walk four miles a day. You need to check your blood sugars numerous times a day. You need to take your medication and all that. And they're telling you that, and they don't have to do it themselves. Well, I'm going to tell you tonight, in fact, I heard one person act, ask a doctor at a support group once about how many times to check her blood sugar. My doctor said once, and he said, well, you need to check it twice. And I know he didn't need to check his at all. But if I tell you to check your blood sugar a few times tonight, then I'm telling you from the point of view that I'm checking mine about 10 to 12 times a day. So that's where I'm coming from in all of this. Whenever you really think about facing a challenge like this, there are always going to be those that are going to come up to you and think that they know more about it than you. In fact, do you remember that guy that lost... 10 grown children. It seems like it was in a, a tornado or something. And he lost all of his property. He lost everything. And he had this friend that came up to him on one occasion and he said, what do you know that we don't know? What insight do you have that we don't have? Well, this man had lost everything. The man talking to him was supposed to be a friend. His name was Eliphaz. And he was talking to his friend Job. Well, one thing that Job knew that he didn't know was all that he was experiencing, everything that was happening to him. And so that's where we're coming from tonight, is the idea that I have experienced a few things and I want to share what I've experienced and the things that I've learned. And hopefully, you know, we can interact and I can learn from you too, because there's always more to learn. Now, there are people that uh, look at diabetes kind of like this headline that was in a prominent newspaper just a few years ago, diabetes underrated, insidious, and deadly. Well, it's underrated because compared to other conditions, well, it, it doesn't even compare, but we know the statistics. Do we know the statistics? That it's the leading cause of blindness, the leading cause of kidney dialysis, the leading cause of non-traumatic uh, amputations, all of those things, that sounds pretty serious to me. And it's insidious because it's seemingly harmless. Because at first, elevated blood sugar, you can't even feel it. But eventually, you're going to feel the results of that. And then deadly, of course, has to do with, well, it causes more strokes. And it leads to that. And heart disease, it contributes to all of that. And so... What we're going to look at tonight is what we really have, what's available to us that will help us. And I, I, I heard this story about these two cowboys way back in the West, two cowboys and their Native American friend. And they were coming up on this little town and they knew the cafe that was there. And the two cowboys were talking about going to this cafe, getting steak with all the trimmings, and they look over their Native American friend and, and they asked him if he was hungry and he just kind of shook his head no. And so they get to town, they stable their horses, they go to the cafe, they get all the steak and the trimmings and all of that, and they're eating and they notice that their friend is wolfing it down faster than they were. And less than an hour ago, he said that he wasn't even hungry. And they were kind of looking at him at amusement and said, you know, an hour ago you said you weren't even hungry. And he said... Not wise to be hungry then. No food. Well, he knew what he had. He had learned to be content with what he had. 
What do we have available for us that can make the difference and that can help us? Do we really know what is available? Now, you look at motivation. Does that look like a, a nice tool that you could use? Now, you look at that as a cartoon, but that really was similar to what took place years ago. We've got to be motivated. Motivation is so important. Of course, when you hear all those statistics about all the, the difficulties, that, the complications that come, some people will say, hey, that's not diabetes, that's just poorly controlled diabetes. Well, motivation is what it takes to stay in control. That's the big deal, to stay motivated. And you look at that, you look at that turtle there, how did it get on the top of that fence post? How did it get there? Does anyone know? Did it, well, did it fly or crawl up? How do you think it got there? I think someone probably put it up there, don't you? And that's kind of how it is for me. You see, back in first grade, I, we were practicing for some Christmas program. That was back in 1960. And I couldn't even stay and practice. I had to go back and forth to the bathroom. And on December 20th, I was hospitalized. And they discovered that I had diabetes. And they would come around with this big needle and draw the blood and check my blood sugar and all that. And the day before Christmas, I was released to go home. And so Christmas Eve, I was able to go home. I was through with that. I was out of the hospital. And the next morning was Christmas, Christmas Day. I was thinking, oh, oh great, all the presents that I'm going to have and all that. The first thing I heard from my dad was, Kenny, it's time for your shot. I thought I was through with that. I ran all over the house. He was chasing me to give me my first injection. And that's where it started in 1960, almost 53 years ago now. But all along, I've been helped, just like that turtle up on the top of the fence post there. I've been helped by my parents, by doctors, by nurses, dietitians, diabetes educators, other people with diabetes, just good friends have helped me to get along. And that makes a difference. It makes a difference for motivation. Now, what, what is it? Tell me what that is. Anyone have any idea what it is? Huh? A shirt? Cotton? Sh huh? Sugar. I have asked, it, every time I do this seminar, I ask this and no one knows the answer. Well, here it is. The answer is called rough. It's my dog. I think it makes a difference when you see the whole picture. It makes a difference. It helps us to realize what we have that's available to us. And a lot of times people complain about, you know, the struggles that they're having, all that. Do they know how it's been in the past and realize how many things are available to them today that can really make a difference? Well, that's what I want to go over. I don't know if any of you remember back in the days when you could get this, this sugar-free drink called Tab. Huh? Did, do you remember that? Still likes it? I didn't know anyone ever liked it. Really? But I would pucker my lips like that guy when I would drink that stuff. But it's improved, hasn't it? Things have really improved. You know, when a person is diagnosed with diabetes, some people don't really think, you know, it's no big deal. Everyone has diabetes. They don't take it seriously. They're the people who aren't here tonight. But other people take it seriously and they look at the different things that they face and they may be saying things like, you know, I feel overwhelmed or I have so much to learn and, and understand or I, I don't know if I can do things right. Well, there are a lot of struggles. There is a lot of things to learn. And I really like the attitude of a 
a Roman scholar, his name was Cato. Cato began to learn Greek when he was over 80 years old. And people were asking him, what in the world are you doing starting such an arduous, difficult task at your age? And here was his answer. It's the earliest age I have left. <laughs> well, there may be things to learn. I don't know what your age is, but today is the earliest age you have left. Right now, today. You know, I think what people really need, they need to hear words that are uplifting. Words that are positive. Words that can build their confidence. Words that can bring out a sense of hope for better health and well-being. And those words, I want to share some of those words with you right now. They go like this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through me, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. And that little statement down there below, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closer to my words and I'll let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. They are health to a man's whole body. And that is God's wisdom. And one of the things that God's wisdom says, well, it says don't do certain things, <laughs> like that cartoon says, but it also says do certain things. And so when we look at that road, does anyone know where that road is? Uh-huh. That's the Talamina Drive. And one of the things that when we look at God's wisdom, there's a little expression that is used there. It goes like this. Wisdom, I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. Well, we know he's talking about upright paths, but here's a picture. I've got a picture of a road here. It's kind of crooked, but we want to straighten that road out. And we're going, to, we're going to apply one wisdom principle to another to make the road straight for us. And so when we look at this, we find also these statements, good news gives health to your body. Peace of mind makes the body healthy. And we keep adding to this, and we're going to try to straighten that road up, make it look more like that. And have the right kind of self-talk. Pleasant words are like honey. They are sweet to the spirit and bring healing to the body. And a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What I want to show you is, here's what someone says, kind of the wisdom of the world, and here's what God's wisdom says. Someone might say something like this, that I feel overwhelmed and especially that way, whenever you are diagnosed with diabetes, a lot of people feel overwhelmed. Or whenever you are told that you've got some sort of complication from diabetes, it can be overwhelming. Well, I want us to think about, here's what God's wisdom says. Good news brings health to the body. Now, remember I was talking about the, the, the little picture that I had that little portion of it and I ended up showing you it was rough. I want us to get the whole picture. How did it used to be years ago? Even now, I do not like to recall the feeling of hopelessness I felt when diabetics came for treatment. And the many sad scenes I witnessed, which the use of insulin would have prevented. And we find that, that he wrote, about Dr. Banting, the discoverer of insulin, a biography of him, and that was back in 1946. This doctor treated people with diabetes before insulin was discovered in 1921 for about 30 years and many years after that. The person who wrote the foreword to the book was Dr. Elliot Jocelyn, and now there is a, a clinic that is associated with Harvard Medical School in Boston called the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. And there's been good books written. If you want to get that book for physicians, which I've read <laughs> with my dictionary right next 
to it, about 700 pages, but there's a lot of wealth of information there. But he treated people with diabetes for 30 years before insulin was discovered, 30 years after. And he kept meticulous notes of all of his patients, 58,000 patients. And he basically would have the same opinion as the other doctor had that I just read. And when they saw those patients that were suffering from diabetes, they would have seen something like JL, age three years, three years old, weighed 15 pounds on December 15, 1922. Now I want, to, I want you to look at how it was for JL. He was one of the fortunate ones to receive insulin. And the next picture I'm going to show you is how he looked two months later because he had received insulin. That's how JL looked. Does he look like the same boy? Do you see his weight? It almost doubled, didn't it? Well, the person who was the leading diabetologist at the time was Dr. Frederick Allen. And he had this clinic with about 100 diabetics in it. And they were, they were type 1 diabetics. And I'll explain that in just a minute. But what he, what he did was have them come up with an undernutrition therapy. It basically, it was a starvation. Basically, he was telling them to eat less, get hungrier. Because he didn't want the, the blood sugar to spill over into the urine. And that is at a level of about 175 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Now... If you check your blood sugar, you know what 170, 180 is. And he tried to keep people from doing that. So basically the way that you would do that is basically starve them. And the person who was able to discover insulin was a man named Dr. Frederick Banting. He was a physician from Canada. He was in World War I. Over there in, the, the, in Europe... He was in the trenches. He was helping those who were injured. He was a surgeon. One time he was hit with shrapnel. He had to put a tourniquet around his arm and he continued to help others for 17 hours until they had to haul him out too. But when he got back, he started giving lectures at a university of, of, on, on, on anatomy. And in, in giving these lectures on anatomy, he started talking about and noticing the pancreas. And within the pancreas, he, he did more research about certain little area in the pancreas. It was called the Isles of Langerhans. And it was from that that he decided he was going to take this extract from that and see if he make the make a dog diabetic by removing the pancreas and take the extract from, from the uh, pancreas from another dog and inject that in there. And he discovered that was the discovery of insulin right there. It's kind of crude. It wasn't really refined at that time. But the man who actually discovered those islands, and you have about a million of them, priceless islands, the Isles of Langerhans. Uh, Paul Langerhans, he was a pathologist in Germany studying for his doctorate degree. And in 1869, he was the one that discovered these little islands, those little things. And within those little islands, there are different cells. There's the alpha cell, the beta cell, and some others. But the alpha cell produces a certain hormone, and the beta cell produces a, two other hormones. Insulin, which comes from Latin, which means island. Insulin and amylin. And insulin is the thing that helps a person to really metabolize the food that he eats. It's kind of like a key. It comes up to the cells and opens them up. Well, people with type 1 diabetes, for some reason, their own autoimmune system attacks those, those islands, about a million of them. We have about 2,000 of those cells in each one of them and attacks those beta cells and destroys them all. So they have to take injections. For people with type 2 diabetes... They may produce some of the insulin, but the body is resistant to the insulin. And it comes to the point that they cannot produce enough insulin on their own, so they may end up taking injections. Or they'll be taking other medications to try to cut back on the resistance the body has 
to those insulin, uh, the hormone that's released there. So Dr. Allen heard about what Dr. Banting had done in Toronto, the University of Toronto. And he went up there and all of those patients that he had in his clinic, about a hundred of them, knew that where he had gone and they kind of heard about what was happening. And one nurse said diabetics who had not been out of bed for weeks began to trail weakly about, clinging to walls and furniture. It was a resurrection. When he appeared through the open doorway, he caught the full beseeching of a hundred eyes, pairs of eyes, eyes that looked like this. And he said, I think, I think we have something for you. This was one of the fortunate ones that was able to receive the insulin at first. And so when we look at this and we think about it, we can go back in history, we can look at how it used to be, which we just went way back. I can go back in part of my history, which goes for decades. Things have improved. Treatment of blood sugars and complications. We have different kind of insulin that's just like ours. Genetically engineered from our DNA. It used to come from beef and pork. And people would have a resistance to it. We also have an assortment of medications. We have new tools. And all along as I'm going through this is knowledge. Now, I don't know if you notice there's a little acronym there. T H A. N K, what does that spell? Thank. <laughs> we have a lot to be thankful for. It used to be that whenever you check your blood sugar, the only way to do it was check your urine. And you would take this little test tape, put a sample on there, and if it stayed yellow, then you knew that it hadn't spilled over into the urine, the, the blood sugar. And the darker it was, the darker green it was, the higher you would be. And even if you were yellow, that meant that you were, could have been 175. That's too high. So to maintain good control was very difficult back in those days. There's one man who went to his doc and he you know, said, you know, doc, how much longer can I go ignoring your advice to keep checking my blood glucose? I heard about this little girl, she's, she's in the house, her, her mother's in the backyard and the phone rings and she's going to go answer. She's just four years old. She goes up to answer it and, and she, she asks, you know, who it is and he says he's Mr. Brown, that same guy that took his wife to the dentist, I guess, but Mr. Brown. And anyway, uh, he wants to talk to her parents and she said, well, not available right now, but can I take a message? She saw her mom do that. And so she asked the question, well, um, what's your name again? And he said, Brown. And she said, well, how do you spell that? And she said, or he said, B-R-O-W-N. And then there was a real long pause. And she said, uh, how do you make a B? <laughs> hey, that's getting down to fundamentals, isn't it? Well, this is getting down to fundamentals right here. Someone says, I can't stand to test myself. It hurts. Well, whereas here's what God's wisdom would tell you. Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Maybe you need to change your thinking about that. Change it. You know, I guess I, I, I mentioned to you how many times I check my blood sugar. I guess I could be called Sir Lancelot. And some people need to remember to check their blood sugars. And this person was helping, you know, was at Postum to try to get them to check, their, check his blood sugar there. But you see the, the meter over there? How long does it take to get a result when you prick just a little, get a little tiny bit of blood on that strip? In yours, it takes five seconds, yeah. You know... They didn't even exist for the first 21 years that I had diabetes. So I got my first one in 1981. It was called an Ames. It was a Bayer Ames. And what you would do is that you would take a very large drop of blood, put it on the strip. You would hit mark one. It would be a countdown for one full minute. Then you would get your little bottle of water. You go over a sink and, and hit a high pressure flow from that to take off the excess blood. Then you go back over to your meter. You would hit mark two. It would count down for another full minute and then you would get your result. 
Now it takes five seconds. And people don't check themselves like they should. In fact, there was a survey done by the American Diabetes Association a few years ago. And you can see those who had type 1. How many never check type 1? You know, they have to take insulin. Well, 21. Those who are type 2, who are now taking insulin, how many never check, would you think? Huh? I do, four or five times a day. Okay, well, you're not one of them, the nevers. You're on the other side. Okay, here we go. 47. Now, those who are on just some sort of medication, or maybe they're told, okay, well, you need to, to start moving more, watch what you eat, get on a meal plan, all that. How many of them never check? Hey, how did you know? Well, that's close, 76%. But people really <laughs> complain about it that it hurts too much or it's, it's just a nuisance, it's too much trouble. And I went for 21 years without even having the opportunity to check. And now, yes, I'm kind of obsessive about it. I love to check myself. I had to check myself right before I started this lecture. Had to. It was 98. And I knew that if I, I've got some insulin still active, I get lower and so I took a little bit of sweet tarts so that I don't start acting kind of <laughs> crazy up here, you know. So anyway, when you think about this, one way I think that is helpful to get people to check themselves more often is to think of it in a different way, just like a gas gauge. But whenever you go and get your strips, what are they called? You check yourself five times a day, what are they called? What are they called what? The strips. Test strips, test strips. I don't care, I just go get it. That's good, that's good. And you check yourself five times a day so that you're not having any problem. But a lot of people have real difficulties with that. And even with that kind of language, I heard about one guy, he was in college, came time for the final. And there he is, uh, I don't think he studied enough. But what he did is, you know, he attached a $100 bill to his final, handed it in to the professor, and send one dollar for each point. And of course, he ended up getting the result back in a couple of days, and when he got it back, he got back his test with attached to it $64. That meant that guy got a 36 on that test. Last time I checked, that's flunking, isn't it? I think it is. But a lot of people, they're thinking, okay, well, I'm gonna test myself, and. And maybe it's elevated blood sugar. And I flunked again. Is that what they're saying? Or they're looking at their meter as some sort of critic. There you are. You're a loser. You just keep blundering through things. Can't you get anything wrong? You know, that's how they look at it. And so they avoid checking themselves. But there's always a hidden factor in all of this. And it's called stress, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. So the idea is instead of testing, change the language to checking or monitoring. You've heard that little saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, they can hurt, can't they? And you know they hurt. So just change the language to that. And I did have a story there, but I think I'll pass on that story. But here someone says, you know, I rarely test. I don't want to hear my meter say you flunked again. Well, God's wisdom would tell you this, pleasant words are like honey, they are sweet to the spirit, and bring healing to the body. <clears throat> Say something pleasant, like I'm just checking myself. I'm just trying to find out where I am, just as the gas gauge on my car tells me where I am. It's not a critic, is it? It's just telling you how much gas you got left. And so, where should your blood sugar be, by the way? 80 to 120? Well, before, first thing in the morning, 70 to 130, but normal is less than 100, okay? And it's ideal to get less than 110, ideal. Yeah, but that's when you first get up. Yeah, fasting. 
when you first get up in the morning. Two hours after starting to eat your meal, and I don't know if you've heard, you know, check yourself two hours after you eat. No, you check yourself two hours after you take your first bite. Take your first bite. They found out that with these continuous glucose monitors that are available now, that's attached to a person, it sends the results every five minutes to an insulin pump like I've got here. Well, they found out that after you eat, the highest point of blood sugar is usually 75 minutes after you get through eating. Through. And so the idea is when you take your first bite, start counting for about two hours, and then check. And that's where you should be. Normals, hundred less than 140. Ideal for us is less than 160. And so you've heard of another test called the hemoglobin A1C. That just checks how you've been doing for the last three months. And that, that glucose attaches to the hemoglobin, the protein part of the red blood cell. And every, it attaches to everyone. It glycates on there. And, but for us, the idea is to try to get that as close to 6.5 or less that you can. It's a percentage that covers the cell there. Well, one way to, to check and is kind of the pair method is that you would check yourself before a meal, two hours after starting the meal, do that three days in a row, you kind of get a pattern, then go to lunch, do the same thing, go to supper, and that is if you're not gonna check yourself, you know, several times through the, the day. Maybe limited on funds or something like that. Yeah. And you can kind of get a pattern that way and see the effect of the food you're eating with uh, your blood sugars. Now, there's been a lot of good good developments, you know, treatments that have taken place. I was in the hospital years ago in the Trinity Lutheran Hospital in Kansas City, and I was there for surgery. I was recovering. I was there for 10 days, and we had a whole wing with people with just with diabetes. And there, I was 35 at the time. Five people younger than me were blind there, right there in that wing there. But something was developed that helped people to prevent this blindness in the late 1960s, I think it was, they came up with a, a procedure to help the, uh, the bleeding that would come from the, the retina there. And I ended up having a hemorrhage once upon a time, 25 years ago. And so I had that laser treatment. But I have good eyesight now, about 20, 25 that's looking straight ahead, you know. <laughs> but I want, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to, to see the difference here. I've got two eyes shown here. That's the guy that, that came up with that procedure and, um, for laser treatment on the retina. And these are pictures of uh, my wife's eyes, the retina, and mine, my eyes. And which one do you think are my eyes? I don't have beautiful retinas like my wife does, but uh, that's what laser treatment would do. So you got these little blood vessels that are peripherating there and they can easily leak. And that's what happened. I had a hemorrhage in my eye. And so, but the laser treatment did away with a lot of those little vessels that were there. And then the main thing is to keep your blood sugars in the normal range to keep that from happening. And so we, we also talk about the kind of insulin that we have. Some people used to have reactions to the uh, pork or the beef, but now it's been DNA engineered, and it's, it's just like human insulin that you take now, just like it. And you've heard of Humulin before. And so anyway, it's very important to have the proper kind of blood sugars and it is important to have the right levels of insulin there. Now, when we, when we went to the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston, my wife and I, they, they put us through a little test there. We took a drink, and then they were going to check our blood sugars and, and see where they would go from there. And the fasting for my wife was like that. Started off at 79, went 30 minutes later to 99, then to 70, to 59, to 65. And mine started kind of high that day at 144, and I had to take off my pump, couldn't have any insulin, all that. 
And then it went from 207, 30 minutes later, an hour later, 260, and then to 329, then to 378, and they stopped it. What kind of drink was that? It was just a mixture of carbohydrate and protein and oh, things. Okay. And anyway, they can check. There's a certain test that they can check about uh, to see what your insulin production is there. There's a uh, the production of the insulin. It starts off with uh, two chains of 51 amino acids, and there, there's little connecting peptides there. And once the process gets, uh, continues, then they're discarded, and they can be measured. And, uh, and they can know how many beta cells that you have and, and if there's any production there. Of course, my wife's were 7.9, and mine were 0 0.05, almost non-existent. But anyway, the first... You know, if you needed oral medication in 1957, what you would take is a hypodermic needle with insulin in it from beef or pork, okay? But they came out that year with Orinase. And now, what do we have? Just one medication after another that have different functions that can be used to stimulate the insulin production, maybe slow down the, uh, the uh, process of uh, digestion, for them, resistance of cells to the insulin, and uh, combinations of some of them. And one new one that they came out with was Genuvia, which kind of has to do with a uh, uh, hormone that comes out of the, the small intestine that goes over to the, the pancreas and it's kind of a signal there and causes the, the insulin to start being produced there. But there's a little enzyme that can stop that from happening. And Genuvia, something like Genuvia, is, inhibits that and allows the process to take place longer that way. And so it happens when you eat. That's when it, that's when it works, when you eat. But, uh, and it used to be that if you had to take an uh, insulin injection, you would have a 26 gauge is what I use, or 25. Someone said, we use that on animals today, you know, on a, on a, a cow or something. Well, it used to be we had to have a big old gauge syringe. Now they're like 31.5 or something like that. You can barely feel them. And of course we have insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitoring system that I was talking about. And so we have all of those things that are available today that weren't available in the past. It's just a matter of being motivated to use the things that we have available. And so there's a lot of good things out there now that we need to be thankful for. Are you familiar with this guy named Rudyard Kipling? He wrote The Jungle Book. In about 1900, it was estimated that he was receiving about 50 cents for every word he wrote. And he would write in newspapers and uh, write the books and things like that. 50 cents, well, man, that wasn't much, was it? Well, that's like $10 a word. If we're going to add inflation to it. There were some students at Oxford University that sent him a message with 50 cents and they requested, send us one of your favorite words. And he sat back, thanks. <laughs> that was the favorite word right there. And so Jesus healed 10 men with leprosy. How many of them said thanks? You remember, just one. I don't think gratitude is really that common. And a lot of people don't realize how powerful it is, not only in relationships with others, but with your own health. And that's what I want to share with you a little bit now. But you know, we sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. And then people go out. They may sing that song, then they go out and live their lives like, like this. When upon life's pillows you are lying down, when you are in comfort and without a frown, Add up all the negatives you think you see, and you'll be surprised at just how mad you'll be. <laughs> Count your problems, name them one by one. Count your problems, scoring what God has done. Count your many problems, make the list real long. Count your many problems while you sing this song. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people are doing. That's my husband. Huh? Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. This is on, <laughs> we're recording this. You know what, Paul, when, when, he, when he wrote to the church at Colossae, he writes to them, and he writes to them 
this prayer. I've been praying for you. Here's what he's been praying for. He says, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Do you see the connection there? Endure and thanks. Endurance is perseverance. It's not giving up. It keeps us going. And whenever you think about this, when it gets dark enough, what can you see? When it gets dark enough, you can see the stars. The stars are always there, though, aren't they? The blessings are always there if we'll just look for them. Just go back. Look in the history. You can do this with almost any chronic disease, though, what we have available today, and be thankful for all that we have. You know, there's two pages that we have in life. There's a a feel-good page and a feel-bad page. And I think that according to God's wisdom, what we need to be looking at most of the time is the feel-good page. You can put it like that, that he who seeks good finds good will, but evil comes to him who searches for it. What are we looking for? What are we seeking? Good will. Well, someone might say that keep good records of your blood sugars, food, and movement levels, and then they come back, you've got to be kidding. Keep records? You've got to be kidding. Well, what does God's wisdom say? It says, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. How many people have some flocks? Do, do you have some flocks, Mike? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I actually asked that the support group in Noble. And yeah, yeah, we've got, we've, got, we've got a flock, you know. We've got all these goats and animals on their land there. Well, this doesn't sound like it has anything to do with us. Well, now remember, all of these teachings for, are for a man's whole bo- health to a man's whole body. How could I apply that? Well, maybe I need to be sure I know the condition of myself, of my own body, the members in my body. Well, you do that by keeping good records. And those who lose the most weight, hey, they're the ones from research that has been done. They keep records. And so one of the things that you can get if you check your blood sugar, you know, you could keep it electronically on a, you know, an iPhone or something like that. You can do that. Get software for it and all of that. Or you can get a little booklet where you keep records in there. And maybe even have a food diary. But how many have you seen that combine with that a gratitude diary? I think it's important to be thankful and to look for things for which we can be thankful. There was a study done at the University of Pittsburgh about 119 heart transplant patients. And they put some of them under a a program regimented gratitude schedule where they would actually do that. Not just come and go, kind of, yeah, I'm grateful. You know, you ask people, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful. But do they really practice it? Well, that's what they did. And the end result of that was that these people were more compliant to a meal plan and medications. Last time I checked, people with diabetes are on a meal plan and usually medications. There was research done at Cal Davis University, which has about 33,000 students. Dr. Robert Emmons did research out there with hundreds, and he divided them into three different groups. One of the groups was the Count Your Blessings group, and another group was Count the Hassles, and another group was just neutral. What they were to do is to look at one week, go back in that week, look at five things that they really looked at, that they were really grateful for. Others were just focusing on the old problems. List five problems that you have. Others could use a combination of the two. And what was the end result of that? Well, here's what they found from that. They found that the gratitude group felt better about their lives, were more optimistic, and exercised more. Last time I checked, we're supposed to move more, too, with diabetes. And so, 
A second study revealed doing it on a daily basis and even increased that idea of gratitude. And so now it is time. It is time for everyone to stand up because you're hibernating and we need to have an ice water break.